Good morning. Man, it is good to see you, whether you're part of our online family, North Campus, South Campus. Uh, it is a joy to go on the journey of life where we just seek to take next steps with Jesus. Now, let's just dive in this morning with the reality. Sex is everywhere in our culture. Come on, I, I don't have to show you images, do I? I don't have to pull video clips. I don't have to make things like really awkward because um, I just promise you, you throw stuff up that's normal in your living room, you throw it up on a big screen in a church sanctuary, and everybody gets really quiet really, really fast. I'm just telling you. We know it. You watch the halftime of the Super Bowl. Sex is everywhere, and that's fairly mild by today's standards. But we need to know this. We're not the first group of Jesus followers ever to have to wrestle with this. We're not the first ones to see the idolization of sex in our culture. The first century followers of Jesus had the exact same. And I, I know you're thinking right now, well, dude, they didn't have the internet. I get it. But they had temples, and they had all sorts of activities that were very, very public, like in a city called Corinth. Corinth was known as a city of sex. For centuries, it housed the temple to the Greek goddess Aphrodite. Now, by the time of the first century, the temple had been destroyed, but the culture had been laid. Sex was everywhere. Paul spent 18 months establishing a church there, and then when he left, he wrote letters back to help those young followers of Jesus mature. So it shouldn't surprise us, given the reality of the nature of the city of Corinth, that the Spirit inspired Paul to hit the issue of sex head on, because it was everywhere in their culture, just like it is in ours, which is why we ought to pay careful attention. In the sixth chapter, Paul says, everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Now notice the words in quotes here. Scholars see that what Paul is doing is he's actually quoting the Corinthians, what they were saying. Everything is permissible for me, but then Paul says, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but then he says, but I'm not going to be mastered by anything. Well, food for the stomach and stomach for food is what they said, but God will destroy them both. And then he gets very specific. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I take the members of, body, of Christ and unite them with a the prostitute? And it's like he shouts, never. See, the culture of the first century, just like we see in our culture today, had this idea that sex was really no big deal. Just do what you want, whenever you want, whatever way you like, because it just has to do with your body. It's like food for the stomach. It's like scratching the itch. If it feels good, just do it. It has nothing to do with anything else. And that's what our culture says today in various ways. There is a, a Broadway musical, award-winning, still being produced around our country. It's actually um, a couple of decades old, but it's called Passing Strange, and it had a song in it called We Just Had Sex. And it's interesting how it approached it. Lyrics, we just had sex. There's nothing sleazy about a natural reflex. It's nice and easy, no need to crane your necks. We just had sex, that's right, all three of us, but it's not complex. It's no big deal at all. That's the message of our culture. It's just sex. It's like eating food or scratching an itch. And that's exactly what some of the first century followers of Jesus in Corinth were saying to Paul. Some of these new followers of Jesus were still visiting the prostitutes of the temples in worship. It's what they had done their whole life. And when Paul had addressed that, they were saying, like, like it's no big deal. It's just the body. They, they were rationalizing their actions because it was the physical body. You see, the Greeks tended to operate by a philosophy called dualism, believing that humans were made up of body and soul. But in the Greek mindset, the body had no importance whatsoever. It was just the spirit that mattered. So in the Greek mind, you did one of two things with the body. Either you denied it any pleasure whatsoever, they were called the ascetics, or you just did whatever you want with the body, which is what most of the Greeks did, because that felt good in, in their mind. And that's what was happening in Corinth. It didn't matter, it was just the body, the body, whatever you do with the body, it really doesn't affect your spirit. But that's not how God made us. That's not how he wired us. According to the scriptures, our bodies, listen to me, are important and what we do with them immensely important. May the God of peace, the God of God himself, sanctify you through and through, make you holy, set you apart for him. May your whole spirit, soul, and what? 
body be kept blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, the Bible is clear that we, like God, are triune beings. God, Father, Son, and Spirit, yet he is echad. He is one in the Hebrew mindset. We, too, are body, soul, and spirit, yet we are one being. And what we do with one aspect of our being immensely affects the others. And that means, listen to me, it's not just sex. Probably more than any other physical activity, sexual activity, and by that I'm not meaning just intercourse. I'm talking about what you look at on those computer screens. I'm talking about any other activity, probably more than any other physical activity, it touches deeply our soul and our spirits. And the reason for that is it's the exact way God designed it. I mean, Pastor Jeffrey said it so masterfully last week. God created sex for the good of human beings. Listen to me. God is very pro-sex. God loves sex. God made sex. Sex was in the Garden of Eden long before sin ever entered the equation. I think some of us think it was accidental. That somehow it occurred that like God made Adam and Eve and turned his back for a second and he turned around and he found them getting busy. And he went, oh my me, I never saw that coming. No. The scripture says, some of you will get that a little bit later, okay? The Bible says before sin entered the equation, the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. That's an innocent way of saying they engaged in marital intimacy. And it was beautiful, wonderful, glorious. I'd go so far as to say worshipful. It's the way God designed it to be. That was the heart of last week's message. If you didn't hear it, it's a must listen to. You can find it on our YouTube channel, you can find it on our podcast, you can find it on our website. You need to hear it. God created sex with a purpose. Beautiful, glorious, wonderful. But that purpose, by the nature of what it is, creates boundaries. The purpose of human sexuality is to bond a man and a woman, to weld, to put together, to join us, not just in body, but in soul and spirit, to one another, to connect, not just at the physical level, but our whole being. It is a tool as what the Bible calls the creating of oneness. And oneness is actually the basis on which Paul argues against the Corinthians. It's not just sex. It's not just the physical body. When you say it's no big deal, you're missing the purpose of sex. Do you not know, Paul goes on in verse 16, that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body. Now don't misinterpret that. Through the centuries, some have said that sexuality, if you have sex with somebody, it makes you married. That is not what Paul is saying. But it's more than just a physical activity. There is a uniting of our souls. There's a tying of our souls together with anyone we have sexual activity in. Why? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. But he who unites himself with the Lord um, is one with him in spirit. And then Paul goes on, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his body. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God. And we go, yeah, and he says, how? With your body. In verse 18, we are told that sexual sin is somehow different from other sins. Now, hear me carefully when I say that. Different does not mean greater. Different does not mean it's somehow larger. At its root, all sin is to fall short of the glory of God. All sin is to be outside the way God designed things. It's to live independent from God, and all sin separates us from God. But, let's be honest, some sins have greater consequences than other sins. They have different effects on our lives, and we know it. I've been involved in lots of marriage situations, sadly, where adultery has occurred. And I'm just going to tell you, adultery does a tremendous amount of damage. By the grace, by the power of God, it can be overcome, but it's very difficult. It's a sin. But we could also say that speeding in your vehicle is a sin. And there's a lot of that sin going on in Abilene, I'm just telling you. But I've never had a woman look at me and say, hey, Pastor, I just don't think I can be with him anymore. He's a speeder. <laughs> Sex, because it was so beautifully and wonderful. Let me, I'm just gonna keep shouting it. 
It's beautiful, it's wonderful, it's glorious, it's powerful. It was meant to immensely bless a man and a woman in marriage. And because of the power of human sexuality designed by God, it has tremendous potential to bring harm outside the purpose for which God designed it. Guys, we know about it. We know all about sexually transmitted diseases that keep coming up, that keep having to be dealt with. Many of us have felt the immense emptiness that if I just hooked up, it'd be great. But it's not great. That friends with benefits really doesn't work out the way we think it does. Others thought we were in love and we were going to move to this thing called marriage so we could go ahead and engage and then sex started happening and then she disappeared and we felt used. Sexual immorality makes promise after promise after promise and it fails on those promises all the time. It is why Paul has one word he wants us to get deep inside. When it comes to sexual immorality, not sex as God designed it, but sexual immorality, one word, listen to it, flee. Flee sexual immorality. Lace up your kids' flyers and get as far as way as you can. Flee sexual immorality. And see, this answers so many questions people give me all the time. I'll get someone who's dating, especially teenagers, young adults and such, they'll say, Pastor, how far is too far? What, what, what can we do? Can we go to first base? Can we go to second base? Hey, I know we can't go all the way home, but what about third base? What if we have outer course and not inner course? What if we have horal sex? Listen to me. There are to be no courses. There are no bases. Think about it with me. What if I use that same logic with my wife? What if I said, hey, hey baby, I was with another lady the other day, and we didn't, we didn't go all the way home. We went to first base. Technically, that's not adultery, is it? There would be something technical happen in my house. It'd be called a TKO, right? (laughs) If not death. The logic makes no sense whatsoever. Why? It is sexual immorality. And we are to do what with it? Flee. Flee from it. Not because God is against sex. It is because of the way God designed it, the purpose he has, and that purpose creates boundary. He loves us enough to tell us that. See, some people in this journey of talking about the boundaries of sexuality like to say, well, Jesus didn't talk about that. He, 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 Jesus never talked about sex and the boundaries of sex and things such as that. Guys, that is really false. Matthew 15, Jesus said, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witnesses, slanders. These thoughts are what defile a person. This word sexual immorality right here that Jesus uses, the same word the apostle Paul uses in 1 Corinthians 6. It's the word in the Greek, porneia. Sound familiar to anyone? It's the word from which we derive in the Greek for the English word pornography. Porneia is just a summary word. And it covers anything outside of God's design and purpose for sex, which is to bond a man and woman together in the covenant of marriage. Anything, listen to me, anything includes hooking up. It includes friends with benefits. It includes sending naked pictures of yourself to someone who is not your spouse. And just as a side note of wisdom, I would hesitate even if it's your spouse to send those pictures out there because once it's on the cloud, it is on the cloud and you don't own it. And so I'd be very careful from a wisdom standpoint. Anything is the stuff on your computer and on your phone that they will tell you it has no harm whatsoever and it is bringing such tremendous damage to humans. Is the main thing that is spurring sex trafficking right now? And we say it has no harm whatsoever, but it also harms the individual. Anything. Anything is thruppling. Anything is a fly or swat, fly and swap vacation. Anything is bestiality and pedophilia. Sexual immorality is anything outside God's design and purpose for sex. And it's not because God's approved. It's not because God didn't ordain this. Human biology, just the makeup of the human body tells us that. As Jeffrey told us last week, the whole book of the Song of Solomon celebrates the beauty of marital sexuality. But when it comes to sexual immorality, we are given a one word instruction we can all understand. Flee, do a Joseph and get as far as way as you can, run. Don't try to play up to as close to the line as you can to see what you can get away with. Get as far away as possible, why? Because God is a good father and he wants you to have the best in life. 
And he tells us the way he designed things. And I, I know some of you think, well, Pastor David, like, you're married. You don't know the struggle it is to be single in the sexu sexually saturated culture. Here's what's interesting. I've done a lot of life with a lot of people. I'm old. And old has put me not in touch with hundreds of people, but thousands of people. And I found it interesting that there are a lot of married people who wish they were single. And some of you married people are being real still right now. So single people think they need to be married. Married people think they need to be single. We have this tendency to think that another station in life will solve my struggles. And, and, and it is just a flat out lie. Listen to me, I understand being single has its struggles, but please know that being married has its struggles as well. Every station in life has its struggles. As long as we do with sex what the culture does with sex, we are gonna struggle. If we embrace the sexual identity of our culture, whether we are single or married, what I mean by that, if we make sex the epitome of everything it means to be human, the epitome of life, that I have to have sex, that I have to do that, sex has to be done in a certain way, I'm just gonna tell you, we will never be satisfied. And it doesn't matter if you're married or if you are single. You can be married, but if sex is an idol, it will destroy your marriage. That which is intended to bless and bring union and oneness will be destructive to you. It can be destructive when you are single as well. There is only one thing that satisfies. You ready? Jesus. Only Jesus and drawing near to him will bring satisfaction to our soul. And when he is preeminent in our heart and life, when he is preeminent in our marriage, and everything falls in line the way he designed it to be, then his gifts become a blessing. The scripture says it is God's will that you should be sanctified. It is God's will that you should be holy, that you should be a set apart. And then Paul says to the church in Thessalonica, just like he did in Corinth, he has to address this issue, that you should avoid sexual immorality. That each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable. Hear me, flee sexual immorality. And sexual immorality, and I know what's being pushed in our culture, but I'm just going to tell you from the scripture, sexual immorality includes same-sex relationships of all forms, all fashions, all kinds. Romans 1, therefore God gave them over to sinful desires. Them is not who you think it is in the text. Them is just those who refuse to worship the true God. Gave, God gave people who refuse to worship the true God over to the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. They worshiped and served created things. Hear that. They took what God meant for our good, they elevated it to the point of being a God, and they served it rather than the creator who is to be forever praised, amen. And then he gives an example. Because of this, God gave them, those people who refused to worship the true God, over to shameful lust. He said, even the women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, men also abandoned natural relationships with women, and they were inflamed with lust for one another. I'm just telling you, this is probably the clearest passage in the entire Bible about this issue. Not anywhere close to the only one. But what you see here is that homosexual acts, which were really common in first century Rome, please hear that. They were very common in the day. They are an example of what happens when we refuse to worship the true God. Now, hear me carefully. They are not the only thing that happens. They are not a heightened sin when we refuse to worship the true God. Paul just uses it as an example of many he could pull from of what happens when we refuse to worship the true God. If you look up earlier in our text at verse nine, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor people who practice homosexuality. Now, you can go on the internet and you can find all sorts of arguments as to why Romans 1, 1 Corinthians 6, and not just them, but Leviticus 18, Genesis 19, Jude 1, 1 Timothy 1, why all these verses don't apply to homosexuality as we have today. But history is clear. The first century had all the 50 shades of gray of sex that we have today. Whatever you can find on the internet, they had it. Most of the time they had it in a temple and you would go and you would do it publicly. Their temples were often sex clubs that you would just go in and as an act of worship, you would pick your kind of sex 
and you would give worship to the deity. So there, I'm just telling you, there were long-term monogamous homosexual relationships as well as casual hookups in the first century. And the scripture is clear, listen to me, all these are outside the boundaries of what God has created for sex. From what I can see in scripture, and I've done a lot of looking, the scripture makes no exception. The purpose for human sexuality is to bond a man and a woman together in the covenant of marriage and anything outside of that violates the design, purpose, and heart of God, including homosexuality. The only way we can justify sexuality beyond one man and one woman in marriage is to abandon the authority of Scripture, which is something we cannot do. But Scripture also shouts something else to us. I need you to listen to me. We have rooms full of people who have fallen prey to different forms of sexual immorality. It is a reality of our culture. North campus, south campus, online family, and the enemy is heaping all sorts of shame because of that. Listen to me. What Jesus did is greater than any sin. Are you hearing me? What Jesus did is greater than any sin, including any kind of sexual sin. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, we just read it, do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? But that is not the end of the story. He goes on and he says, and that is what some of you were, but you were washed. You were sanctified. Come on, somebody should be giving praise to Jesus right now. You were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our Father. Constant through, throughout my life. Um, one thing has been my relationship with the Lord and always, um, I always remember being a Christian even from the earliest, earliest of ages. The other thing that has always been a constant has been same-sex attraction. And I, I can even remember like being five years old, and I know that that sounds perhaps bizarre, but I can just remember being that, that young and knowing something was a little bit off or something was a little bit different. By the time I was in middle school, it was, um, it was definitely pronounced. When I look back and I see, um, I see the just trying to understand, you know, why did this happen to me? How did this happen to me? Was I born this way? Was I, um, was it something, you know, traumatic in my childhood? Because there were things. What I know um, was that it certainly was no, there was definitely not a choice in what I was feeling at that point. While the feelings aren't a choice, at some point you do have to make a choice on what to do with the feelings. You get to a crossroads where you either, you see it as a uh, temptation to battle or you see it as an identity to embrace. And those are two very different roads. And so I've always seen it as a temptation to battle. And um, I certainly understand why people do embrace it as an identity. Um, but I just, have never been able to reconcile that with my with my faith. The biggest blessing was that I was able to marry, and um, my wife has been such a constant um, support to me. I remember before we, when we were very close to getting engaged and talking about it. I mean, I was very honest with her and said, "There's, you know, one more thing I've got to tell you." Certainly thought that marriage was going to going to help it. And like most of us who get into marriage, we realize it sort of does the opposite and it shines a light on all of the brokenness within us. And so it, it actually got harder after I got married. Throughout my marriage, I've had periods of victory. I've had periods of complete defeat. Back in November of 2019, I was, um, I was driving home from Austin to Abilene one day and I remember pulling over in my car, and up to that point, my um, things were things were spiraling for me behind the scenes. Things were were unraveling um, of my own doing, of sin, you know, of of making sinful choices. And um, I just remember pulling over my car and getting out my phone and just typing a um, 
a note about not wanting to live anymore. Walked into church two days later and David asked me how I was in the foyer. And I said, not good. I just remember being completely blown away that Sunday, just sitting in the service. It was one of the things that happened to me that Sunday was the Lord just showed me. He showed me myself and I was just basically split down the middle. And one side of me was completely dark, just darkness. And the other side of me was light. And I was just, I just saw this, this picture of myself. And I remember the Lord saying, look at the side where your heart is on. Your heart is on while I was split with darkness and light. My heart was on the side of light. That really started a period of me, I would just say just some accelerated change occurred in me that was, um, I went through a very intense process of the Lord working in me. Basically hit rock bottom through that process as well. Um, but it was just, it was all for, for my good and the Lord working in me. There was just a moment where I felt the Lord speaking to me and he said, he said, I'm giving you a letter, which I felt like was a little, little different, but because letters of identity are so important in the LGBT community. And he said, my letter is R, that you are redeemed and that that's all that matters. And that's the end of the story. I am totally and completely redeemed and I know how to battle and fight. And it is, there is a way to live. It is not hopeless. It is not, um, certainly not easy, but there is a way to have this struggle and to be totally and completely redeemed. One time Jesus was having dinner with a religious leader of his name. Uh, we happen to know the name of that religious leader. His name was Shimon, Simon. And while they were having dinner, a, a woman interrupted their dinner. And she came and she fell at the feet of Jesus. And she opened a bottle of very expensive oil, poured it on his feet, and she began to wash his feet, but not with a towel. She took her hair, and as she's weeping and crying, she takes her hair and she's wiping the feet of Jesus. And the scripture says that Simon had a thought. If this man were really a prophet, he would know the kind of woman who is touching him, what kind of woman she is, that she is, and notice the word, a Sinner. Now, we don't know it for sure, but most scholars believe that this was a woman caught in all sorts of sexual immorality because Luke 7 calls her a woman of the city. And in Simon's mind, a righteous man, a man of God, would never let such a woman come anywhere close to him, much less touch him in any form or fashion. But Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, perceived Simon's thoughts. And instead of just immediately confronting him, and Jesus is so masterful, he just asked Simon a question. He says, two men owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii, the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he canceled the debts of both. Which do you think will love him more? Simon replied, I, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. And Jesus said, you have judged correctly. I mean, you need to go read Luke 7 this week. But listen to these words. He finally said, therefore I tell you, Simon, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much. But he who is forgiven little in our minds will love little. Man, there's so much depth in that verse. But notice, Jesus doesn't condone her behavior, does he? Her sins are many. He doesn't say you really haven't done anything wrong. You just go and do you. You haven't violated anything, God. You are just scratching an itch, dealing with a natural urge. It's not a big deal. No, he says your sins are many. See, Jesus had this amazing way that he accepted people, loved people, without affirming the sins in their lives. 
And the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, John 1 says. And we have beheld the glory, the glory of the only Son from the Father, who came to us full of both grace and truth. And the truth that we will shout from this place until Jesus comes back or he decides our season as a church is done and he passes it on to others, I don't know. But we will shout this truth, that what Jesus did on the cross is greater than our many sins. He forgive. I will never look at the word redeem again in the same way in my life after hearing Dan's story. He will redeem if we will just do what this lady did. She fell at his feet and gave her life over to him. If you were to ask me the many sins in my life, they are tied to sexual immorality. I stand here as one forgiven of many sins. Sexual sin. Now I will tell you, I I don't understand the feelings and temptations of same-sex attraction. That's not my struggle. It's not the way sin has manifested itself in my life, but I understand sinful struggle. And I understand sinful struggle that I didn't choose, I didn't want, and go back as long as I can remember. And I remember thinking that when I gave my life to Jesus when I was 13 years old, that those struggles would go away, and they didn't. And I remember thinking when I get married, Those struggles will go away, and as beautiful and glorious as my wife was, those struggles did not magically go away. I stand here telling you I am a person who needs both truth and grace in his life. If you are listening, maybe you're live at one of our campuses or online, maybe you're listening later on our podcast or YouTube channel or whatever, and and you're struggling with sexual immorality. I don't care if it's same sex or opposite sex. I don't care the form. I don't care the fashion. I don't care if right now it's fantasical. I don't care if it's physical. I I, I don't care what it is. Just listen and listen well. Jesus loves you. If you fall at his feet, he will not reject you. If you do something as odd as wash his dirty feet with your hair, he's not going to turn you away. And he invites you to come to him. He invites you to come to him for washing, for purification, for wholeness. I will confess that the church at large, when it's come to sexual sin, has not done a good job. We we have this tendency to have disdain for people who struggle with something I don't struggle with. It's an an amazing thing. We of all people should have grace because we know struggle, we know sin, and we know how much Jesus has had in our lives. But we haven't always done a good job of showing God's grace and love when it comes to sexual sin, period. But especially same-sex attraction, struggles, issues. I understand that the culture is pushing so hard right now. And because of that and us Responding back to that, often our response has been to grab hold of truth, but with an anger, with a lack of grace. And from what I can see in Scripture, a lack of grace is just as sinful as any act of sexual immorality. If it has been communicated to you that your struggle with sexual immorality, whatever form, fashion it might be, is somehow different or worse than normal people. I'll stand up here as a representative of the church and leadership of the church at large around the world and tell you I am so sorry. That is a vile and gross misunderstanding of the gospel of Jesus. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us are in need of Jesus. I'm sorry if You have been condemned for having feelings you didn't choose or ask for. We should have understand what we did, but I want you to hear having a feeling or a temptation is not a sin. We have to do something with it, but feelings and temptations are not sins. And I wish I had 
the ability to speak for every church everywhere in the world. I guess I really don't. Um, but I wish I could speak to your specific situation, but I, I, I can't, but I can tell you this. I can speak for this church, and I can speak for this leadership. We love you wherever you are on the journey. And we want you to have the very best God has for life. We want you to have abundant life. Jesus said there's a thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So we will love you enough to tell you what we see to be his truth in the scripture because the enemy uses lies to steal, kill, and destroy in every area. But one of the most powerful ways he's stealing is sex and sexual immorality. But Jesus came that we do not have to be bound to death and destruction. Jesus came that we may have life and have it to the full. And we will be a place by the grace and power of God, imperfectly, but we will battle with you to have everything God has for your life. If you don't mind, I want everyone just to take a moment and bow their heads. And I know the Lord is speaking to you right now. I want you to listen to what he is speaking to you. And I want you to embrace. Maybe we've had attitudes towards certain struggles. Maybe, maybe you're a person whose sin hasn't manifested itself in his life with sexual immorality, so you have a hard time understanding. You have a hard time understanding the lure of porn on the internet. You have difficulty understanding same-sex attraction. You have a difficulty. That's just not your thing. That's okay. Praise God that's not your struggle. But we can at least say, God, we, we can understand struggle. We understand. I understand sin. Give me grace and love. Without compromise of truth, give me grace and love for all, no matter their struggle. And I, I just challenge us all right now. Would you declare that Jesus and Jesus alone is your source of satisfaction? Jesus and Jesus alone is the source of life. It doesn't matter if you're single. It doesn't matter if you're married. Some of us are wrestling in our marriages because we've made our spouse, our activities with our spouse to be something they're not intended to be. We've idolized them. Jesus has to be center of our marriage. If you're single, the Bible has a high value for the station of singleness. Maybe we need to ask for forgiveness for looking down upon that which Scripture highly elevates in fact, if you're single and you have felt, you have felt that somehow the church has looked down on your station in life, please forgive us. Please forgive us. It's not true. Now, by the power of the Holy Spirit, would we grab hold of God's view of sex right now? The glorious, beautiful nature of what he's created, a gift that he gave if he calls us to a certain station in life. But listen to me, it is not a God. When we take God's gifts and we make them God themselves, and we do it long enough, we get handed over to those sinful desires. So let us remember that sex is not the end all that our culture says it is. It is not the most glorious facet of humanity at all. Just a gift. Beautiful gift, wonderful gift, powerful gift. May we use it for his glory and honor. And maybe you need to ask for power to flee sexual immorality right now. You need grace. Some of us are in relationships that we shouldn't be in right now. Some of us are doing things in the privacy of our home because of the internet, things like that, that we, we've got to be broke free from. Maybe you need to reach out to us and our men's ministry, our women's ministry will help you in these. I'm not saying you won't be tempted. I'm not saying you won't have ideas, but we can be tempted and not lust. We can have feelings, but not act upon those feelings. Where we're given in the temptation, let us repent and ask for wisdom to take the steps we need to take. Father, I want to say thank you to for a people who really do want to be holy and set apart for you. We want to demonstrate your glory, we want to demonstrate your honor and your praise in who we are, in every facet of who we are, body, soul, and spirit. We want to honor you. And so in this world that says so many things that are contrary to what you say, we say, oh God, we embrace what you say. 
about everything, including sexuality. And where our minds have been awry, we ask that you'd bring them in line, that you would transform the way we think. Forgive us, oh God, and let us forgive ourselves for where we have walked in sexual immorality and give us grace to do exactly what you called us to do, to flee sexual immorality. Not because we despise what you call good, but because we honor you so much in all that you have created and designed. And so let the way we think and the way we act in regard to sex bring glory and honor to you, I ask in Jesus' name.